Please join me in welcoming Jeff Spence. Everybody hear me okay? Right, fantastic. In uh, 2009, I believe it was, I was invited to, uh, to sit as a panelist in, uh, in Basel, Switzerland. And we sat up on a stage like this, and we had, it was a little bit bigger of an auditorium, but uh, sat up on a stage with a bunch of, bunch of business students. And we're talking about uh, entrepreneurialism and business growth and whatnot, kind of for the, for the Western European area. And I sat up there, and there was a German guy, and there was a French guy, and there was a Swiss-German guy, and another American guy, and then I think I was on the end, appropriately, on the other side. And the, and the moderator got up and started talking about sort of introducing everybody, but introducing everybody in light of, okay, hey, this is Wolfgang Puck, or whatever the guy's name was, and gave this, gave this long dissertation of what they've done, and what they're gonna do, each person as I go down the line, is gonna tell you, hey, what's the one thing you should do? What's the greatest piece of advice you could give to a new entrepreneur? And so, you know, person by person, she'd go down, and this person was a London school of whatever it might be in these fancy places, and they gave this, these, these great explanations. And I, I'm, I get the best seat, really, because I get to think for the next you know, 10 minutes as to, man, what's my piece of advice for these people who are, who are sitting here? I hope they speak English, and if, uh, if they do, I've got to have something at least halfway intelligent to say, so I've got it, okay, and this is what I'm going to say. Well, then the, the German guy over here gets up and says emphatically, don't do exactly what I was thinking of telling everybody to do. Yeah, I thought, oh, great, now I've got eight minutes to get this thing done. And the next person goes down, and piece by piece, every single one of these people unwound every bit of good, good advice I was going to tell everybody. Right? And I think, I said, what, what in the world am I doing up here? And everyone, I went to Chico State, I'm an athlete, i got no idea what these guys, I can't speak, I can't even understand polytechnic something, I don't know what they've done. They're smarter than I am, there's some disconnect here. And it kind of got me thinking about, first off, how do I get off the stage? That was the first one. But the second thing was, why was there such a massive disconnect between what these people who obviously had, had you know, great thoughts about what should be imparted as far as this new entrepreneurial world in Europe and what I was going to share were so vastly different? So kind of a little bit of a history. You kind of go back. In my, my childhood, I grew up in very rural Northern California. So anybody here been to Northern California? Anybody? OK. Four. Okay, so Northern California to most people, it kind of goes Los Angeles, San Francisco, Oregon, Washington, Canada. Well, I was, I grew up 250 miles north of San Francisco, so up in the mountains, and I spent every waking, every waking hour outside running around the mountains, and there was this thing that always kind of got in the way, what I was really trying to accomplish, and every single day it was a problem, was, it was school, right, and every day I'd try, I got to, I got to go to school, and if I don't go to school, I'm not eligible to play athletics. I want to do athletics, and I want to climb mountains, and then there's school. And so I uh, fought through it best I could, and uh, I did far better than I ever thought I would. And I graduated uh, 101st out of 154 graduating students in my high school. And uh, when, I was, when I was applying for college, yeah, even with that, I was applying for college, that tells you this. I've always liked a challenge, you know, so climbing mountains to me wasn't about so much climbing the mountain because if, if you wake up at 14,000 feet or whatever it might be, climbing a mountain is not so exciting, but starting at 3,000 and going up was always exciting. And so the less and less information, less and less equipment you had or the less you had at your disposal, trying to get up, up, up a mountain or trying to raft down a river without a raft, whatever it might be, was more exciting to me. And so I'm going to go to college, and I'm sitting with my counselor, and he knows I'm going to go to college, and I'm going to be a decathlete in college. I, you know, it just it sounded pretty exciting, and it was 10 events, and it was more than nine more than other people were doing, so I'm going to go do that. And, and, he, and he kind of sat me down and said, Jeff, listen, in a, in a very nice way, you're not the smartest kid at the school, right? And you're going to go get a degree, and, or you're going to go uh, you know, train to be a decathlete and do whatever it might be. Hopefully you become professional, because that's pretty much what your future's got laid out for you. And, I sat there and I said, well, what are those degrees? And he said, well, here's this one, a little easier to get through, and this one here doesn't have any labs, and here's these ones here. And I said, well, what's the, what's the, what's the hardest degree you could actually take? And uh, again, not very bright. And he said, we don't know what the hardest one is, but we know that incoming freshmen are least likely to graduate in electrical engineering. That was, that was it. I said, great, I'm going to apply for electrical engineering, get a degree in electrical engineering, and, and, uh, and, uh, and train in the decathlon. So, I, so I didn't get that nice letter saying, hey, welcome to UCLA or whatever it might be in electrical engineering because apparently my scores weren't so hot. 
But I got a phone call from somebody from the <coughs> who actually, I was trying to play football at the time, phone call from somebody who connected and said, listen, we're going through all this stuff that you've done. And it really, we're just kind of confused. First off, do you know what electrical engineering is? <laughs> I said, I just said, yeah, I, th I think. And it has to do with le electricity and engineering, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And there was, you kind of you sense the guy on the phone. I'm not with him, but he's on the phone. Just looks like this. He's like just thinking to himself, going, almost like, man, I, I got to see this, right? I got I to see this guy try to come be an engineer at this university. So uh, fast forward, I got accepted in engineering, beat the tar out of me. It was far harder than running track and field in college. Um, and halfway through that, I took a course in physics. And I said, well, this is pretty cool. That was really, really hard. And I think I got some, I got a great grade in the, in the class, like a C plus or something. I said, this is, this is really cool. <coughs> Excuse me. And it just dawned on me, well, what, how, how cool would that be? And how much more difficult would that be for me to go to get a degree in physics and electrical engineering? Well, all along this way, I've had advice from my counselors saying don't go to engineering, and now I got advice from people in college say don't add physics to engineering. You're barely going to graduate as it is. And this whole path is about you're taking these risks that are completely unnecessary right now. Right? Get a good GPA, go to a good college, get a good job. Here's the path. This is what you got to go do. Right? I said, okay, I'm with you on that one. So I signed up for physics. and. Uh, Got a degree in electrical engineering and physics. And when everybody else was getting, again, swooped up into Harvard or Carnegie Mellon, whatever it might be, um, I think they had my, my address wrong. I wasn't receiving those envelopes anymore. But I did get, instantly, I, I applied to universities. And the University of Colorado, actually, I think your, your president's the former, uh, former whatever my president, you know, Bud Peterson was there. And I got a call. And again, same kind of call do you really know what applied mathematics is? And I said, sure, I know. It's kind of applying mathematics to whatever you're doing. I don't know what that really is. So, but I, I got accepted to go to University of Colorado. And the reason was, at that time, really, they said, we kind of scoured the world for this thing. We went through all the records. You were the only intercollegiate athlete in the United States that's got a degree in electrical engineering and physics, period, full stop. Right? You're interesting. That was it. I was different from everybody else. Not only was my grade point average very different, but I was just different. <laughs> it was very, very different. And so, so again, I decided to go to Colorado. And then I said, you know, like, like most people would go into grad school, I'm going to go start my own software company. So I raced off to start my own software company in Austin, Texas. And uh, fast forward about 30 days, I'm working at a software company in San Jose and um, enjoying it, having a great time. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, OK, uh, I've not followed any bit of advice that I've ever gotten in my entire life. Nothing. Because I wasn't bright enough. I couldn't follow advice. And yet I'm sitting here and I've got a good job in San Jose, degrees. I'm still traveling the world. At that time, I'm still competing decathlon. I'm still traveling the world doing that. And it's not so bad. This isn't, this isn't, this isn't such a bad deal for me. Right? And it started thinking about things, saying, well, all those people who are giving me advice about what to do and what not to do weren't at risk of any of the bad things they were saying that were going to happen. They were just there. They were pundits. They were just telling me, hey, don't do this, don't do that. Bad idea, get a bad GPA, whatever. Perfectly happy where I was. Perfectly happy. Right? So I started thinking to myself, here's the revelation is, you know what? You know, advice isn't altogether so good. And I've kind of felt for the first time in my life I was actually smart for being the only guy that didn't listen to any of the advice that all these smart guys were saying. And it put me in a position where I said, how can I actually unwind all this bit of great advice? I can go scour the world for great bits of information from people and then intentionally disregard it. That's got to be the way I like, to, like to, to march forward into the future. And so to a certain extent, it's what I did. Don't travel the world if you don't have to. Focus on business domestically. There's more, there's more financial resources. There's more human resources. There's better education. All these things that happen here domestically happen here for a purpose. This is, what we, this, is what, you know, this is what we should be investing our time and resources into. You don't need to go anywhere else. So again, like, like, like you should do, listen to the advice. I, uh, I've been to more than 80 countries. 
I've traveled the world. I've been been all over the place, uh, and from business purposes to humanitarian deals to um, charities to working with the UN, uh, working with uh, a number of different organizations, and just personal travel. I've been everywhere. I mean, there's uh, now I can't name all of them, but I've been I've been all these all these places. But it's advice that no one ever would have said, drop what you're doing, race around the world, and try to create stuff. And there were much more, there are much better decisions to be made that have been far more accretive to my financial value if I would have listened to what they were saying. Get a job at IBM, get a job at Accenture, get a job at these places, go build your career, go do these things. Not interested. Just didn't do it. Right? So we talk about risk and reward. <coughs> But we look at these things and saying, here's these great pieces of advice. I go back to Basel as an example. Here's these great, great chunks of advice coming from these guys. They're sitting there and they're, they're laying these things out. And it finally dawned on me, well, there's this continuum between this risk-reward thing and then this regret on the other end. Right? I, could, I could avoid all the risk in the world and I could then just, just love on regret over here and say, I didn't go do all these things, right? I didn't climb those mountains. I didn't, I didn't raft those, I didn't go down those rivers. I didn't do whatever it might have been, but I secured my future over here, right? And it dawned on me very clearly that that's what these guys were doing. These other guys here who were unwinding everything I was gonna tell, they were really saying, let me paint the safest picture for you. Now, it's not the most lucrative. It doesn't have the greatest chance of success, right? It doesn't offer you any, any uh, great opportunities to, to create anything new. It doesn't give you the ability to meet new people. It doesn't open up markets for financing. It doesn't do anything else. What it does is it just tries to mitigate loss. Right? And that's the world, right? It's going to try to mitigate loss. I'm going to sit here and do this. Well, but then it dawned on me, again, because I had lots of time. I was, I was the, the little guy over here with the dunce cap on this side of the stage. I could think this thing and think, where am I? Well, I'm in an entrepreneurial forum. Well, how many entrepreneurial ventures are banked financially? I mean, so I'm start, starting a new business. What's your name? John. John. So John goes and starts a new business. What's the chance of you going down to Wachovia or Wells Fargo and getting a loan to start your business? Pretty terrible. Right? It's not going to happen. Right? So if that's not going to happen, somebody's going to give me money. And if somebody gives me money, they're going to want actually a decent size rate of return. So this whole thing about entrepreneurialism is I better have something that is paying back at higher, at higher value or no one's gonna give me money. So the advice this person is saying is cut your losses, basically. Reduce the risk exposure to yourself. Reduce the risk exposure to yourself. Things were you know, great bits of information that you guys didn't have to come to, a, to get an MBA to learn. Management is key. You, know, you, need to, um, you need to have the best management in place to actually secure invest, investment capital. I think it's complete BS. Right? Next thing down here, make sure you focus on something that's bi this big so you can execute on it and get it done. Forget about that. It's a waste of your time. Right? Go down the line. Right? Everything that they were saying, absolutely, when you're in the world of entrepreneurialism, means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. And no offense to anybody in here who wants to be an extraordinary manager or anything else. I'm not a great manager. I get people in here who, who work for me and who have worked for me. They'll tell you, I'm not a great manager. Right? But the, the reality is, is that management is a commodity. It's an absolute commodity. I can go on the market right now, I could look it up on Monster, whatever it might be, and I would look up manager, right? I look for the big numbers on it, I'm gonna hire that person. If management actually was important to your business, if that was a bankable thing for you, then CompUSA, um, you know, Borders, go down the line, all of those companies would still be in business today. They're great managers. Matter of fact, they'd have some beautiful thing on their investment, their, 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 their PPM, their private placement memorandum, would say, we have 9,000 years of management experience this company. Still went out of business. Right? The only thing that really matters, really, is do you have smart people? Smart matters. I look around this room, you're at Georgia Tech, which means, by definition, you're smarter than I am. I couldn't make it here, not a chance. Right? So it's smart people with big ideas. The big ideas matter because I don't want to invest into a small idea. I don't want to, I don't want to be chasing things that, that don't really matter. Remember, when, you, when you're starting up a business as an entrepreneur or you're in a small company or whatever it might be, your chance of success is very, very, very slow, or very, very uh, slim, excuse me. So if it's slim, now let's, say, let's, let's say it's even better than anything. It's a chance, of, it's a one in 10 that you, that you succeed. By the way, it's not even close to one in 10, but it's one in 10. 
then why do I want a one, let's say a two for one return on my capital? I'd rather put it somewhere else. So now if we back out and we look at this, again, this, this risk world, what we're really talking about is the two things between, as John pointed out, his idea may not be bankable. It's not bankable, but it's investable. Right? And this whole thing has got to be, when you look at risk and you look at what you're going to go do as a, as, a, as, a, as a new business person out in the world is, I don't care how bankable I am. I want to be investable. Bankable people, sure, you can go get a job. Absolutely. I can guarantee you if you're highly bankable and if you checked all the boxes and you did all the things that all these people said that I should go do that I didn't go do, it's guaranteed a job. I was probably guaranteed unhappiness. I was probably guaranteed alcoholism. I was probably guaranteed a whole slew of things. I was guaranteed. Right? But if I'm investable, I can go do anything I want to do. Right? I look for people in my business now, we could talk about that in a second, that are wickedly smart. Right? They better be smarter than I am. It's kind of the low watermark on there. Wickedly smart. And they, they get the fact that this is not a bankable enterprise. Right? They're, they're, they understand that everything we do every single day has inherent risk baked into it, but they don't care. Right? They don't care. Right? I know right now, as an example, right, my company, right, so Innovolt today, will run out of capital unless we go raise more money. That's a little unnerving position to be in. Right? Well, shoot, you know, we got how many, 30, 30 employees, whatever it might be, and growing rapidly. If we, if we can't convince somebody to invest in our company, we're going to run out of capital, shut the doors, fire everybody, crying and all this kind of stuff going on. That's just the nature of the business. That's what I've been doing for 15 years. It's, kind of, it's just it's the way it is. Nothing in our business is bankable. We don't, we don't waste time talking to banks. We don't waste time think, talking to people who want a bankable experience. Okay? So that's the way that, that risk, risk lays out. So I kind of encourage everybody here, and I'm not going to take up a lot of your time. You guys are, you know, this is late in the afternoon. You got any coffee you got to go to. But encourage everybody here to kind of do a little soul searching as you go through all the career stuff. And you're going to hear a lot of BS from guys like me, frankly, right, that are going to tell you, you need to go do this, you need to go do that, or whatever it might be. But you got to look at yourself and say, OK, on this continuum, or in these chairs up there in Basel, where am I? And I'm not saying what they were saying was wrong. I'm just saying what they were saying wasn't appropriate for me and probably wasn't for the crowd they were talking to. But where am I on this continuum? Right? If risk scares me, if change scares me, if, if uncertainty scare me, if, if the, the, you know, the standard business 101 documents that you guys are well beyond right now, if the, the, the basic tenets of business are the ones that I want to live by, then get out of this world, get out of the entrepreneurial world, because it doesn't, it doesn't operate that way. It just doesn't exist. Right? But it's also one you got to look at this thing and say, all right, well, I want these things. What do I need to go after? How do I actually participate in the entrepreneurial environment? How do I recruit the right guys? How do I make myself acceptable to people? And the reality comes down to don't buy into, don't espouse the things that these guys would say. Right? Find the right environment, do the right things, you know, and, and do the same things you do as a, as a little kid. I mean, little kids inherently, picture a parent watching the kid the entire time they're saying, don't do that, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. Because the kid has absolutely no capacity, no capacity whatsoever to weigh the risk. Right? Oh, look, scorpion. Right? They have no idea what happens after, look at the cool scorpion. Right? There's, no, there's no understanding of that. And somehow in the middle of our life, that just flips over. And then we have no capacity to weigh or measure reward. And all we do is we, f all we, do is we focus on risk. And so you have this, this culture we have. And again, you know, if I hire one person, we interview 30. And I guarantee you, 25 of those people have this, I can identify everything that will potentially go wrong with this situation. Right? Here are all the things that could go wrong in this job. Here's all the things that go wrong if I leave this comfort that I'm in right now. And the reality is, what's really going to go wrong? So you try something, doesn't work out, eh, move on. Right? The, typically, these risks are far less, or far, you know, far less important or far less meaningful than you, than you think they might be. So uh, um, that's, what I, that's what I wanted to share with you guys. How quick was I? Oh, that's pretty good, 20, 21 minutes? Is that right? Stuart, is that good? Okay, good. All right. I'd be lo love to open this up for questions. 
I promise not to berate anybody or say you're. You can teach people to be risk takers, or do you have to be sort of born two cards short of a full deck to do so? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think about that all the time because you, as a, and, and I'll answer it in two ways. As an employer, it's, um, it's a losing proposition. I, I think you can be taught those things, but I think it's something you have to actually be exposed to and culturally kind of go through it. As an employer trying to make that switch, you're not going to get there. And it's going to take too much energy and you're going to make too many, I'll say, good decisions along the way to try to transfer that person into, some, into somebody who's going to be much more entrepreneurial thinking. You know, so um, the answer is yes. I've seen people over careers transition. I think some people are, I don't think it's genetics either. I think it's just maybe, again, it's, it's, it's lack of acumen. I'm not sure what the whole thing would be, but people's ability to kind of to not see the danger in things, the inherent danger, I think is more natural. It, it's an, it's an, it's, I think it's an experiential thing. That's my, that, that would be my take on it. Hi. Uh, my name's Morgan. I'm a fourth year business administration student. Um, I was just wondering what your, the piece of advice you finally gave at the, when you yeah. got to the end of the line. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually, my, the piece of advice that I gave was uh, don't listen to experts. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the only thing I left. That was it. Yeah. Nicole has a question. Hi, I'm Nicole. I'm senior in management. Um, I was wondering, you have a ring, you're married. I don't know if you have kids, but how has that, do you think, like, you know, having yeah. people who maybe rely on you, how has that changed your, your risk taking? Um, <laughs> it probably hasn't changed as much as my wife would have wanted to change. Uh, I think what happens is uh, it's, I think the amount of risks that I take have declined over, over the years with, with, with the wife and the kids. But I think it has less to do with my personality or my, my focus on making sure they're okay and more to do with the fact that every waking hour is spent at soccer and gymnastics and volleyball and lacrosse and whatnot. I don't have time to do anything stupid, right? So I'm kind of <laughs> captive to this thing. You know, I think given the opportunity, I could be just as stupid as I was years ago. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name's Austin, and I'm a, a business management major. Um, kind of a personal question. You talked about growing up in Northern California, being outside. What is one of the stupidest or riskiest things <laughs> that you did when you were younger? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think if you talk to my friends, they, they could give you like dozens of them. It'd be a big debate over that. But I think the one that is probably, knowing that I went and got a degree in, in engineering afterwards, uh, we were climbing, we we're climbing from the Nevada side of the Sierras over to the California side and the Yosemites, and, uh, or into Yosemite from that side, because that way you don't have to pay the, the, the gate fee coming in from California. <laughs> and, uh, and as we're going over, you're going to these mountains and whatnot, and all of us, the one time you look up and you go, there it is, there's this rock, and it's rock probably, I don't know, it's probably 10 feet long by six feet wide. It's this big. It's got to weigh, you know, is, is, you know, as much as a bus. It's a big, huge thing. And it's perfectly propped up where you can get behind it. You can push it with your legs. And it's all this, this uh, shale rock down below. And there's a cliff that drops off about 2,000 feet. Just goes straight down, right, down into the glacier below. And we're up there. And we're pushing as hard as we can. And, <laughs> and it's just not budging. You know, but again, I'm the engineer. I, I, I understand this thing. There's, you know, there are liberal arts majors. They got no idea how to get this thing to go. And so, so I think, and I'll, well, shoot, I look over the top. Why, there's the problem. The problem is the rock that's on the other side is keeping this thing from going, right? So I climb over the top and I pull this rock out. And all of a sudden, the entire thing just starts sliding. Right, all this rock sliding, and I'm getting kind of lower and lower, and the rocks are moving their way up my legs, and I'm, I'm just like this whole, it's like the whole room is just moving like this, and I'm going over, and I can't pull my feet up, and finally I do pull a foot up, and I've got no shoe, right? So I pull a foot up, and no shoe, and I'm going down, <laughs> and I'm going down, it's just dust and rocks, and pretty soon rocks are shooting at me now because it's sliding down this hill, and they're shooting at me, I'm ducking, and they're hitting me in the chest and the legs, split my knee open, and I come over and I stop about two feet from the cliff as it goes off. Right? And uh, you know, the, I think the best part of this thing was that my, my, my friend Andy stood there on the rock with a camera the entire time. <laughs> <was> just... 
<laughs> taking pictures. So it's like this whole thing is kind of like chronicled in, 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 uh, in film. You guys wouldn't know, it, but you used to have these film cameras you had to crank with your thumb, take a picture. And so, uh, uh, yeah, it was that. And uh, so then the human chain to pull me off of the, from the cliff's edge. But uh, that's probably not the brightest of things that I did uh, <laughs> as a kid in Northern California. Yeah. Hi, my name's Allie, and I'm a biology major, and my parents want me to get a job with IBM and everything, but being a biology major, I want to go play with the mountains and the scorpions. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could just tell me. Can we talk to you, your parents for you? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you have this lifestyle. Like, I would love to go to 80 countries and yeah. go hiking all over the place, but how did you finance this? <laughs> Endeavor. Did you start yeah. taking risk immediately right after no. college or did it take a while? Uh, yeah, I'm going to give you some horrible advice, by the way, right now. <clears throat> uh, and don't run out and do whatever I tell you next. Don't do. Just absolutely don't do it. Uh, I am a believer that the finance, you figure the finances out. Right? If, you got, if you've got $1 and it costs you $1 to get to India, then take that one dollar. Go to, if, that's, if that's where you want to go, if you don't want to go to India, it's a horrible, horrible expenditure of your last dollar. <laughs> but if you want to go there, use it and you go, right? And you just kind of figure things out. I mean, pe humans are far more resourceful than we ever give ourselves credit for. And what happens is, is we'll we'll typically look at things and say again, back to the risk, the risk side of things. I can picture all the things that could potentially go wrong, and pretty soon, here's the reserves I need to do to go to go go you know to go to India. Right? It was the advice, well, make sure you're financially solvent, make sure you've got everything all put together and your professional career is in place before you have kids. Horrible advice, because then you'll never have kids. Right? Go have a kid. Right? You figure it out. Right? And you know, it's, it's fine. You see people in you know, third world countries carrying their kids around. We could do that too. Right? So you just go do it. Right? And you've know, you, you got to look at this thing and say, if you're sitting in this room right now, if you're a student at Georgia Tech, you are in the one percentage of the top one percentage of the, of the smart people in this world, right? However you want to look at it. Your resources are far beyond what, what I had personally, what I still have. You've got the capacity to do whatever else. And so you can't look at people, watch CNN or Fox News or MSNBC and say, this is the way people act. Oh, man, I need to be like those guys. You don't operate in that world. Your brain doesn't function at that level. You guys will be able to make as much money as you want, do the things you want to do, but you can't wait till you have the, res the resources and all this great punditry about what you should have in reserve and what it means to go do it. You've got to say, well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy a bus ticket. I'm going to make my way you know, to the East Coast. When I get to the East Coast, I'm going to buy a plane ticket, and I'm going fly to fly to India, whatever. You, you just go do those things. You can make money anywhere. You could live off very little, right? especially right now. I mean, how many people in here are, say, under 25? OK, it's one or two of you. OK, good. Okay. How many people in here have, are, are married with kids right now? OK, so you may not want to go to India right right away. Everybody else, what, what do you lose? I mean, is, is it you, you, you think that going somewhere, whatever it might be, and traveling around is somehow going to you know, invalidate your degree at Georgia Tech? You come back a year later. It, it, what's, the, what's the downside? Right? A thousand things people will tell you. Don't go this, don't do that, don't go to Europe, don't whatever it might be, focus on this, go to grad school. Um, last time I checked, there weren't a lot of grad schools that went out of business, which means if you come back the next year, it's still there, right? You can still go to grad school. So just do whatever you want to do. And so for me, it was out of just sheer, uh, I'd say, uh, again, stu I'd say stupidity, because I'm not, I knew where I was going, right? But I. I just made the decision to go, and you just figure these things out. And if you like what you're doing, and you've heard this a thousand times, if you like what you're doing, you'll be successful, whatever. It's true. It's absolutely true. I love what I do. I can't tell you what I do. <laughs> I don't know what it is to do. But I, but I enjoy it. I wake up in the morning. I know that I'm going to go do these things. right? And so I, it's, it's fine. And I make money because I do those things. Right? So, um, so my, again, my advice would be, if you don't want to go work for IBM, don't go work for IBM, because you'll be a horrible failure. You'll be fired from IBM, and then you'll be the, the Georgia Tech graduate who's fired from IBM, right? So skip over that and go do something you want to do. Yeah. yeah. My name is Sam Stachura, and I'm a business administration IT. And you're a parent, and a lot of us are being hounded by our parents to avoid risk. But how would you feel if your children 
either embrace risk like you have or just completely go the, the normal route and avoid it? <laughs> the normal route. <clears throat> um, that's, a, that's a really good question. Uh, two of my kids are lunatics, okay? <laughs> Certifiably, they've, have, they've got really, there's just not a lot of grasp in reality. My, my, and then one of my kids, my older one, is very cautious. Okay. But I think there's, there's a difference between, we talk about risk taking as far as what you're going to do with your career and the, the cautiousness and what, you, and what you're trying to kind of hoard and get your arms around. I think it also comes down to teaching your kids, which I, I think my wife's done a good job of, I've done a horrible job of, teaching your kids what to love. Right? And not talking about specifically love this, right? but what's important to them. Right? If your kids think that, you know, that, you know, that safety and security and retirement at 63 right, is what you're really in this thing for and to love, well then I don't care how, how crazy you might be, right? you like to bungee jump, you do all these kind of things, but here's my 401k and here I'm gonna make this decision, make this decision. On the weekends I'm gonna go ride my mountain bike, I'm gonna do whatever else, but here's what I'm gonna do to make sure my finances are in place. So, so I wanna be careful about talking about risk taking because there's, diff there's different aspects of it, but it comes down to what are you focused on? Right? I'll be honest, I'm, I'm 42 years old. I, I, know I look 50, but I'm 42 years old and I haven't even begun planning for retirement. You know, I'm not saying I'm broke. I'm just saying I haven't begun planning for retirement. I, I, don't, I don't know when it's going to happen. Maybe it's next year. Maybe it's when I'm 85. Right? I, it's, it's part of what I'm sure I'll get to at some point. I'll make that decision like we were talking about. I'll make that decision when I get there. Right? But I don't, I don't love it. That's not what I'm, that's not what I'm in this for. Right. So if we have kids being crazy or not being crazy, I think you've got to focus them on what's important to you. And I would say, you know, back to the girl that's not going to go to, go to IBM, uh, you've, got to, you've got to say, I'm going to go do stuff that I actually love to do. And then there you go. And I, if, if, my, if my kids do that, crazy kids or not crazy kid do it, I'm perfectly happy. Hey, my name is Dan Russico. I'm a master's mechanical engineering student. Um, as we grow up, our parents or people always ask us, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Or you always have this idea as you uh, gain more experience and knowledge and skills of a vision for your future. Um, but it kind of sounds like you take the opportunities that are in front of you at the time and um, maybe not as much have this vision yeah. of what's going to be ahead five years from now. Uh, how have the risks and opportunities really factored into uh, making them, your vision uh, clearer or something to that degree? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that uh, uh, it's another good question, and it's and it's it's there's a lot of ways I can answer that. Um, I'll go with the truth. The um, uh, we talk about what do you want to be when you grow up, or what's your opportunity, and there's and there's this master plan of I want to be. I'm going to be a, uh, a you know a professor in mechanical engineering, or I'm going to go I'm going to go design the next the next uh, whatever it might be for NASA. That's that's what I'm that's my big design. I'm going to do that. So I'm going to hold off for that job. That's okay, right? that's fine. You, and you you can do that kind of stuff. Um, to me, it's um, what excites me right now, right at this one moment today. What excites me, because. I, again, I'm looking at this thing and saying somehow, somewhere, I put this thing in my head and said, I want to be this, this, this NASA engineer. That, that's all great. Well, if I love that, we're talking about you know, that much, well then, even if I'm doing this right now, I'm still moving to that. Right? I'm still, then if I love it that much, if I don't, it'll fade and it'll go away. And I'm still doing the right thing I should do. You know, so people have this, these master plans for their life, and this is what I'm going to do. I know you guys, got, you guys are crazy enough to be writing down what I'm saying, which is just complete lunacy. You should smoke the piece of paper you're writing on. Okay. <laughs> is, uh, is, you know, the, the plans are going to change. I mean, I, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm in my 40s. If I look back to things that I thought and said in my 30s, I go, who, who was that guy? Right? He's insane. Right? Let alone the 20s, and I don't know what I did before, before that. Right? But it's, it's really, you've got a plan today because that's who you are, because that's how your brain works today. Right? And, but tomorrow, I guarantee it's going to be different. 
right? Especially in your world right now. Believe it or not, you know, you guys are all in the business business world. I guarantee you that 95% of you will be in the business environment, whatever that might be, uh, operating to something that has to do with technology. Okay? It's just it's just the way it's going to be. I don't care what you're in. If you're in medical field, if you're in if you're in pharma, if you are in uh, um, I don't care uh, food processing, it's all about technology. Everything's about technology. So great. Now that it's about technology, Moore's law applies. Everything you think is going to be out there from a business, from an opportunity, will evaporate in 18 months and regenerate in another 18 months, and it's out and running. Why plan, right? Get in the middle of it. Start creating stuff. Start taking risks. Start creating value. Because the guy who's waiting on the outside to kind of merge into this business traffic at the right spot is going to be stuck on the shoulder not being able to get in the road. You've got to get in there, take a job, do a great job, but understand that you're not married to whatever it is you're there. Right? I guarantee you this, and again, this is a horrible thing to say. I know I'm a business operator and whatnot, and I love my employees. Right? Is I love the employees because they love being there. As soon as they don't love being, love being there, I will gladly help them go somewhere else. Be pleased to have them go somewhere else. No, 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 I don't, I, don't, I don't care. If they're not the right guy for the business, and sometimes they don't know it yet, but if they're not the right guy for the business or if they're drowning within my company, I want them to move on. Right? You're talking to somebody right now who let go the guy that generated the most revenue within our business. Right? He was the number one sales guy, right? Brought in the biggest accounts, whatever it might be, wrong business, wrong, wrong place for him. He would be uncomfortable if he gets uncomfortable and unhappy. The people around him are going to be uncomfortable and unhappy, which means I could look ahead and say it's a bad thing. Let's get rid of it right now. Let's move on because I have to love today. Right? So you, I'd look at it and say, I've got this master plan to go do something else. Get and do something that excites you today. It might be as a, you know, a, the person who sold me my Starbucks down here in, on, in, in Barnes and Nobles. That's totally cool too. Love it. And if you love it a lot, then the guy that comes up and buys coffee from you, the guy will hire you to go do something else. Right? Uh, by the way, I've done that. I've hired probably three or four waiters and waitresses and you know, whatever. Because you look at them and go, man, you just, you just love life. You love what you're doing. Come work for me. What do you want me to do? I have no idea what I want you to do. Just, just quit what you're doing right now and come work for me. You know, call you in a week. Right? We've hired a number of people at our business right now that, frankly, I had no, I had no spots for them. I just said, just don't go back to work. Right? You now work for Interval. Right? We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out later, whatever it might be. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Hey, my name is Qi. Uh, I'm a fourth year biomedical engineer major. Uh, I just have a question for you. Like You say you're always taking risks. Uh, during your college, for example, you say you say you choose double E because you think it's the hardest. So I was just wondering, do you really like your major? Because you feel, oh, it's challenging, so I just took it. Or do you yeah. like afterward? Do you really enjoy it? Or and maybe when two risks like fall upon you, how do you like weigh which one you are gonna choose? That uh, that will be all. Yeah, um, I, my degrees in electrical engineering and physics. Um, I loved them because of the challenge. That was that's really what I loved about it. It's same thing as you know, if you look talk to a guy who's again climbing a mountain or whatever it might be, if you were to ask him between thirteen thousand feet and fourteen thousand feet, right? Or you know, we I mean, we uh, we climbed uh, um, you know uh, uh, Takora, say between you know nineteen five and twenty thousand feet, when it's left step, right? You got to breathe for a little bit, left step, and breathe for a little bit. If you're asking me right there, do I love climbing? I'd say I hate. Climbing. It's a horrible experience. I just want to go down. But, but the process, right, going through that, knowing that you're going to accomplish something is what I enjoyed. Right? So electrical engineering and physics. If you would have asked me any time between my freshman year in college and my senior year in college, graduating with these degrees, hey, are you going to be an electrical engineer? <laughs> I still don't know what one of those guys does. I have no idea. You know, I, I have no interest in being an electrical engineer. Didn't want to be an engineer, didn't want to be a physicist, but I, I, I loved the challenge. And I loved, you know, and I also loved the fact that you had tremendous faculty just pouring information into you. And that was cool. I thought they're all in this one spot. I go to this one building and a bunch of smart people pour information into me. It's easier than reading, it takes less time. Right. So that, that was kind of the deal here. So for me, when the risks get too much and I'm going to get underwater with the risks, I, I'm in no worse position than anybody else in here was. 
I think I'm just better at rebounding from risks now because a bunch of them bit me in the butt, right? I've, I've learned how to deal with things that haven't gone right. And that's just because I've, you know, I've <laughs> put myself in horrible positions too many times. Right? But I'm still here. You know, I've broken lots of bones, but I'm still here. And, and I, you know, and I still, I still love the risks. Tell us a little bit about uh, Innovault. What Innovault. product and services do you make? Yes. Why does anybody want to pay you for them, or I do don't they? Know why and they pay um, for them. What, you know, what's your plans to um, you know create value for your your investors and other stakeholders? Ah, I love it. Straight man, I paid her for that. By the way, this is, this is an infomercial. This is a uh, uh, Innovault's actually a power protection technology company that was was born here at Georgia Tech. And so a uh, super smart guy uh, had uh, to, a professor here, Deepak Devon, had come up with a way to make electronics live longer, right? Took take away disturbances on the grid and a bunch of stuff that none of you in here are any more interested in than I am. But it works, right? The technology works really well. So you take your piece of electronics, you plug it into our box, plug our box into the wall, and magically stuff lasts longer, fewer faults, you know, fewer service calls, all those things, okay? doesn't sound very sexy. And the reason is because it's not very sexy. It's just, just this box. But the technology works. And back to the whole thing, I think it was maybe Frenchie number two. I forgot who the guy said, don't go after anything big. Well, for us, looking at this thing and say, well, great, here's this newfound surge protector. No, right? The Innovolt's technology, right? It, it reduces the cost of electronics ownership, right? It's a pretty, pretty big deal. I mean, that's, that's ultimately what it is. If you own electronics, if your stuff is protected by this Innovolt technology that came out of this, this great university, then it's less expensive to own. You have to replace it less times, you have to, you know, you have to service it fewer times, whatever it might be. You're talking about a trillion dollars in electronics will be sold in 2015 or 16, whatever it might be. What if we reduce that cost of that ownership by 1%? How much of that could we have? So it's a, it's a big deal. It's a very, very big deal. So Innovolt has moved from, from you know, we, are, we, we basically cut our teeth in the office equipment industry selling to guys who serviced copiers. And the reason was because they serviced copiers. They, they had to go out and service these things all the time, but they died. Plug our stuff in, magically things don't die as much. So I don't have truck drivers driving around trying to fix copiers. I don't have broken machines. Um, massive deal. So we've gone from, um, I don't even remember when I came in here, January of 11? January of 11. We were $500,000 in revenue. We'll, we did six million um, that, that, that trailing year. We'll do about 18 million this year. Okay? And so it's, it's, a, it's, now it's, it's a, and now it's just a small company. Before it was an infinitesimal one. Now it's just a small company. But we're a real concern. Right? We've got real channels. And we're expanding into uh, South Africa, Latin America. We've been selling in Canada. Uh, we've got partners right now that want to take into Asia. We'll probably do all those things, but we're pushing out product as fast as we can. Every dime of investment that we get in the business goes into forward production of these little ugly black boxes so we can get these things out there because they're already sold. Okay? So uh, tremendous technology. It's a great business, um, and, and we're growing, growing very quickly. Jeff, yes, you mentioned um, working um, in the humanitarian sector and with you, and, and I was just wondering if you see a difference in risk taking in the social versus the commercial sector that um, you work more in, and, and if there is something that you think one sector should learn from the other, what are yes. your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's, risk taking is very interesting in, in the humanitarian world. Uh, one is that we traditionally, and I think, it's, I think it's a human thing. I don't think it's an American thing. And people say these greedy Americans. No, no, no. Americans give far more money than anybody else on the planet. I travel the world raising money for humanitarian efforts. I could collect more in a day here than I could in a month in Europe or, or you know, whatever it might be. We give. We give a lot of money. But back to the risk profile. We give money that is absolutely not at risk to us. That's what we do. So if, if I think that it, I, I need a million dollars to live, uh, then I'll give you anything over, say, $5 million. Right? I'll give you some piece of this, because something might go wrong. Right? Catastrophically might go wrong. I don't want to give anything more. So the risk profile of giving is very, very acute. We look at this thing and say, we have this perception of humans that whatever I earned was out of luck, not out of skill. So I learned it out of luck. So if I earn this money out of luck, then I've got to hoard it 
because I'll never be able to get that money back again if I lose it. Right? So uh, uh, that's, that's a piece. That's on the financial side. Operationally, you have the, the issue of, again, humanitarian efforts of us not wanting to expose ourselves to certain risks. I don't want to be involved in that because it might fail. Right? I don't want to try to save whatever it might be. It might fail. Going and do micro loans in India or whatever it might be. What if this thing doesn't work out? That was a waste of my time, waste of my effort. The reality is, is what's, what's going on out there right now is not working. It's a guaranteed failure, right? It's not going to work. So you apply what you can, <coughs> excuse me, you apply what you can to these things, and, but you find out the guys who are out there and doing those things aren't risky guys like me. They're people who have just reduced their expectations for their financial worth <laughs> to the point where now I'll live off of nothing and I can be this person working in Bangladesh or I can do, I can do whatever it might be. But it's a, it's a weird, vicious circle. A group of people over here saying, I'll give only what is absolutely beyond what I know I can live on for the rest of my life, which reduces that amount, which means that somehow all wealth earning was lucky. It's good. Then you have the people who are out there and giving are also not really risky people. I mean, who are actually administering this stuff aren't really your risky people. I think you could take a group of true entrepreneurs, honestly believe this, take a group of true entrepreneurs, pay them what we pay them to be entrepreneurs here, set them on fire around the world, and they would change so much more than anything else has ever happened before. But we don't. For whatever reason, we just, we just don't do that. You know, we just don't, we're, we're, if I'm an entrepreneur, I work in a business. Right? But we don't know you can go out and have a far greater impact somewhere else. Jeff, thank you very much for coming to thank Georgia you. Tech. Thank you, appreciate it. <laughs>